Welcome back on the AM show. We continue with a conversation this morning as we get into our big stories. We are interacting with the Member of Parliament for Bole Bamboy. And some of those crucial issues I've already laid bare in my blunt uh, thoughts I'll be looking at. But I'll also be contemplating uh, taxation in relation to non-compliance by businesses in Ghana, corruption as far as the Public Accounts Committee sittings are concerned, and uh, why the opposition NDC thinks the 24-hour economy is a game changer. But um, let me now bring in my guest. He is a legislator for Bolibam Boy. Yusuf Suleimana is his name. Good morning. Good morning, Ben. How are we doing? Um, under the circumstances, <laughs> we, we are managing. Yeah. But today is Mr. President's birthday. Do you have any, any words for the president? Yes. As, nice as, words. As, as nice words. It's his birthday. Ben, first of all, let me say good morning <laughs> to uh, our viewers, especially the people of Bole Bamboy and for that matter, the Savannah region of this country. Yes, today is the birthday of our president, uh, who's left with some few moms to, to go. I can only wish him well and to suggest to him that a few moms left, he should do something so that he's able to go home with some legacy. Mm. As it stands now, if he was to end his regime today, uh, I don't think he'll be going home with any good uh, legacy. Uh, he inherited an economy that was far, far better than what we are seeing today. Mm. He inherited um, a situation where we had been able to resolve the issues of Dumso. Today we are in Dumso. And so if these things are not resolved before he leaves uh, office, um, I think that that will be what will be, he'll be remembered, remembered of. And so I wish our president very well. Um, like I said, he should end up well. That's what I want to say. All right. He's 80 today. Yes. It's a grand old age. You know what the Bible says, 70 years assigned to every man. Not every, everyone gets there. Uh, and I use man in the generic sense, as the Bible does. And 80 years, if you are strong. No, it's a blessing. He has, he has reached 80. It's a blessing. But there's a saying that it's not the number of years you live on this earth that matters. Mm. It is the good deeds that you would have left behind if even you spent a very few number of uh, years. And that, for me, is very, very important. Mm. You can live for centuries and will not have any legacy that people will use to mention your name after you've gone. And so if you ask me, yes, I want to live longer, but I want to leave this world with some legacy that even when I'm not there, people are able to associate those good things uh, with my name. And I think that, that for me is very important. I mean, you... to, be, to be honest with you, I don't want to go very Islamic, but the Prophet Muhammad... I uh, spent only 63 years, okay? Mm. But his name is everywhere. And his religion keeps on, you know, expanding. That, for me, is worth, uh, it's worth it. It's, it's better than a situation where you would have lived for 200 years when you have nothing to show. But I, I wish the president very well. It's a blessing. I mean, to have 80 years on this earth is, is a, a, a blessing. Well... So let's get into the substantive issues that we're going to be discussing. But before we get into them, you, you watched my blunt thoughts. I was talking about Dumso. And now people are coming up with their own timetables on the back of what the energy minister said. And he says, why would people think such evil for the country uh, in terms of a, a timetable? I don't know about it being evil, especially when we just want guidance in respect of our power situation. Two days ago, my lights went off <clears throat> on five occasions. Sometimes I get home and I, I can tell the power must have gone off at some point because something, maybe my fridge, my fridge is the easiest one to go to, and then I can tell that something happened in my absence. In some places, they say in the course of the day, it goes off by evening it's on. In other places, I mean, it's a mishmash uh, issues. What is your doomso situation where you are? Do you have a timetable yet? I'm struggling to draw my own timetable because uh, it keeps on going off and on, off and on. It started, and I thought it was going to be Mondays and Thursdays. And so I took notice of that. Now 
uh, I can tell. Last night, for instance, it went off about three times. It rained heavily around my area. That's coming 20. Right. And so in the evening, it wasn't there. And then it came back around six something. By eight, nine, when the rain started, it went off. And then after some two hours, it came back. So in fact, uh, if we have a shadow, that will help us. And so I was surprised when I heard the energy minister more or less insulting the intelligence of Ghanaians. For me, you owe us that responsibility. You're a minister of state. It is a taxpayer's man that is used to pay you. The comfort and whatever you enjoy is as a result of the taxpayer's uh, efforts. And so if you cannot do anything at all to resolve the matter, and Ghanaians are not even saying resolve it immediately, they are humbly asking you to give them a shelter so that they can plan. So that if I know that from morning to evening I'm off, I know what to do. In fact, this morning, it was difficult to even get light to iron my, my, my shirts. And so these are some of the things. But I am not surprised. I like Napo. But even on the floor of parliament sometimes, his attitude is that of, uh, he has this kind of arrogant posture. I don't know whether it's part of his life. It's better he, 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 he I mean, he has to do something about it. This is a man who why, wants Why, why to do you call him arrogant? If not, because I also know that in this country, if you are outspoken and you, you have your convictions and you speak in a certain manner, sometimes confidence and a stance. There's a difference between confidence. There's a difference between confidence and arrogance. Mm. Ghanaians have humbly asked you, as their minister responsible for energy, that yes, we know that we are in difficulties. Yes, we know that we are in doom. So all we ask of you is to give us a schedule so we can plan our lives. And then you respond to them in this manner. If that is not arrogance, I don't know what else I would describe as arrogance. Okay, that's not confidence. If somebody is confident and somebody is speaking his mind on issues you know, but when somebody wants to insult people, you also know. And that, that's unfortunate. I am aware that he's one of those who is uh, hoping to be a running mate with this attitude. Wait, wait are, you saying, are, are you saying he doesn't make the cut for you? I mean, with this kind of words and, 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 and posture uh, as a minister of state, but if you become a vice president, I'm sure you whip us. You ask the military and the police to whip us any time we speak our minds. This is a colleague member of parliament you're speaking. He's a friend. He's been education minister, he's now energy minister, and you speak of him in this manner? Well, I'm not insulting him. I'm simply saying that if he doesn't change this attitude, somebody's told me that he, his ministry uh, apologized or something. I haven't seen that uh, apology uh, correspondence. But if that is true, then it contradicts his position, okay? So for me, going forward, Napo should respect Ghanaians, and Napo should be um, mindful of the fact that it is the taxpayers' man that we used to pay him. And this posture will not take him anywhere. And that's my advice to him. I'm not insulting him. Let's quickly take a look at the two other issues I raised. And, and I see you have, have some of the data when it comes to open defecation. But there's also the crucial issue of our cocoa and where, where we find ourselves. Uh, we've plummeted, I think, apart from the 2020-2021 season, when we had a, a high of 1 million metric tons. Going back to 2016-2017, when we had almost 1 million, 900, uh, and I think 80-something thousand plus. We've been falling, and now we're almost half that figure. At a time when a ton of cocoa is more expensive than copper, where we could have, if we were producing on a higher level, like Cote d'Ivoire is doing, we could have reaped the boons, but we are not. So I want your quick reflections on these two, and then we'll get into it. Yes, so we all know that in 2015-2016, we're getting to 1 million metric ton. Mm. Now, go and look at the records. At that time, we had also embarked on expansion of our uh, cocoa farms. And that is what resulted into the increment in the subsequent uh, years. Unfortunately, there were other factors that were also reducing the population of cocoa in this country that we didn't pay attention to 
or we thought that you know other matters are more important than cocoa. For instance, take Galamse. We were in this country when farmers were crying and saying that their lands were being taken by uh, gold miners, yet we didn't do anything about it. So what do you expect, Ben? The result is that people now decided to even sell their cocoa farms, and those trees were felt, and all of that. Again, it's as a result of mismanagement. I remember very well that the, uh, the Director General, the, the, the CEO of uh, Ghana Cocoa, uh, Cocoa Board, Cocoa Board came to meet the Public Accounts Committee. And you realize that the kind of debt that they are accumulated, they are unable to even pay the debt. Yes, still, the kind of expensive life they are living, and again, the number of people they have recruited. Nobody is saying don't recruit, but you don't recruit that because you want to get jobs for people. When they go sit there and they didn't do anything, these are some of the problems. And so for me, I'm not surprised that we are here. Uh, all we want is that there should be a change of government, and that change of government should be able to avert some of these situations. One of the things that we are proud of is this cocoa uh, industry. Say so a change of government. Sure. But I just but, told you. But, but hold on, hold on. When I, you know, when I deal with politicians, I always want to hold you to uh, our ways, and that's fair. When when the NDC, the previous administration, was in power, there was op open defecation. There was galamse affecting uh, cocoa, and we had doomso. So no, first of all, let me start with yes. the issue of doomso. We had Dumso, but Dumso was resolved. Yes, but we had Dumso. Yes, but it was Three resolved. Years, and Dumso had... didn't start with the NDC administration. I, I that never said that. Yes. I never said so, that. So, yes, there was Dumso. Started Dumso. all the way from Rolling. Yes, but there was Dumso, and Mama accepted that there was Dumso. It's not today that people don't want to even accept that we have Dumso. When we, have, we are in Dumso, that is honesty. That is transparency. He came out and said, yes, there was Dumso, but I was going to fix it. And he did fix it. That is the difference. To the issue of Goku, I just told you, that yes, even though we're having problems with Galamse and all of that, yet we're able to move to almost one million. And then I also told you that we had planted so much, that resulted into the expansion or the increase in cocoa farms and all of that in subsequent years, which they inherited. Now when it was their time to also ensure that yes, they reduce the Galamse impact on cocoa farms, yes, they also ensure that they expand the farms, they fail in doing that. And that is why today we are going back. And I'm saying that, yes, when we come back, we've done it already, we will be able to do it better. That's just what I'm saying. Now, the issue of open... Let, 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 me, let me just take you back to Doomso briefly. Yes. Um, your own member of parliament on your side, yes. Edward Bauer, yes. together with other analysts, have yes. said that, look, it's going to get really bad with the power situation, especially from 2025. No matter who takes over, that person is going to inherit quite an albatross round their necks, um, right? Um, how, how, do you, how does your party hope to deal with the Dumso situation, assuming a, you get into power? Inshallah, we'll get into power. But you see... You don't have the, any money. You are, are no, an IMF no, program. Yes, but let me, tell you, let me tell you, this is the NDC for you. And Bawa, Edward Bawa, who is a very good friend, would have told you that we are working seriously on our manifesto, and there's a think tank, a group, of experts who have been put together. And at one of their meetings, I was privileged to be there. And they had identified that, yes, 2025 onwards, we're going to have a serious uh, problem when it comes to power. And so what are they doing? This think tank, I can tell you, have put together a proposal that is going to resolve this issue when we come to power. Now, what I will not do here is to expose to you the proposal that they have put together. I'm privileged that to, have, to have that information, but it's not for me to sit here and say that this is what we intend to do to solve it. Okay? If they cannot fix it, they should back out and give us the way, and we'll fix it. And that was what we were told. We were told that if the kitchen was hot, we should back out. In 2016, yes, we left the kitchen. They came in. Now it's hotter than it was. And so for me, whether it's about electricity or power problems, what is about Galamse problems, we are saying that we are better off, we are in a better position to fix it. And that's what I'll tell you, Ben. All right. Um, 
Were you going to make a final point on open defecation? Yes. Yeah, so, so I want been, to reserve the rest of the time. It's been, it's been, it's been an issue over the years. And if you go to my constituency, I've seen NGOs supporting crown communities with uh, very simple, uh, if you like, KVIPs and other facilities to ensure that they don't do open defecation, even the rural communities. And like you said, sometimes we can also play a role. In my case, for instance, there's a community called Mandare. An NGO wanted to give them water. And the condition was that if you do not have uh, a KVIP or a toilet facility within your vicinity, you are not going to benefit. So the individual were, household were struggling to do this, how to go in to assist them by giving them about four to 500 bags of uh, cement shared to each uh, household, which helped them and they were able to put up these uh, facilities. And that enabled them to benefit from this water project. And I think that uh, government should pay attention to this, and all of us should pay attention to this, because it's a very serious matter. But just to conclude on this, even in Accra, as we speak, Accra is not the neatest uh, town in this country. But we promised by the president that he was going to make Accra the cleanest uh, city. What has happened to that? Again, apart from uh, uh, open defecation, the general well-being, the general cleanliness of our environment is very important. The NDC had introduced a monthly cleanup exercise, okay, by community people voluntarily. They were not going, this wasn't going to be to bring any cost to government. What happened to it <clears throat> when the MPP took over? They decided that they were going to stop it. They stopped it, and as we speak. Go around and see what is happening in our communities. Why are we doing this? We, we have our filth exhibition. It's, it's, it's something we, a series we've yes. started. And this actually feeds into it. It, it. it paints quite a picture when it comes to filth. But even as we talk about what leadership should do, sometimes I also look at us. How do we manage our environment? You see people dropping things everywhere. And once you do that, once you litter like that, there will be consequences. It comes back to bite us, especially when the rains come. But no, you see, everything boils down to leaders. I, I agree that there should be some level of cooperation, some level of, you know, uh, responsibility from the citizenry. But I'll go to Rwanda and see. I've been there before. The facilities are there. If you want to drop something, you move at every reasonable distance. There's a dustbin there, you can drop it. So if I want to drop something, I don't have any place to drop it. I put it in my pocket. How many of them can I keep in my pocket? At the end of the day, I'm tempted to drop it somewhere. So yes, there should be some kind of collaborative effort where the facilities are there. And when the person now refuses to do what is right, then you can hold the person responsible. I remember very well the late uh, uh, Vice President, Ali Umar, Ali Umar. who had started uh, an initiative where we're saying that uh, uh, even urinating uh, indiscriminately was going to be, uh, 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 wasn't going to be accepted. He started it very well, and he was catching up with Ghanaians. What happened to it? So yes, I agree that we have a responsibility, but it all boils down to leadership. Put in place all the structures and see whether people will not uh, obey. Like I said to you, voluntarily, Ghanaians were ready every month to go out there to clean their environment. Right. What made us to stop it? So I guess today we are some, some precedents have been set that are haunting us uh, now. But let's get into other matters. There are three crucial areas I want to address with you. And I'd like to start with, since you, you, you are very interested, you're an interested party, you sit on some of these corruption-related matters emanating from the Public Interest and Accountability uh, Committee of Parliament. What's the latest you can share with us and how are things going? Because we've heard this use of even free SHS feeding and the different groupings involved, skewed in this area or that. But I'd like to find out from you, what are you unearthing? In that? And, you know, the Public Accounts Committee reports are structured in a way that uh, makes it very interesting. For instance, we look at procurement uh, uh, irregularities, we look at tax irregularities, we look at contract irregularities, we look at debt, outstanding irregularities, and many more. Now, when it comes to corruption, what I've observed is that 
in all the sectors, you have some semblance of corruption going on. Take school feeding, for instance. You go to the school, the report shows that they have received this quantity of food items. Then you uh, ask them physically, and they tell you that they haven't received that. But the money has been deducted as source. So it means that... And this supplier has been paid. This supplier has been paid. For you, goods not delivered, for goods not, not fully delivered. Not fully delivered, in most cases. And the head teachers are coerced to a point that they even find it difficult to talk. I remember in Tamari, for instance, one head teacher said uh, he doesn't want to talk and, 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 and something will happen to him. So he was trying to cover up. We had to push and push and push, and then the accountant now contradicted him. And it was so clear that, yes, even some of the foods, for instance, if you are in, let's say, a community called Savilugu, and they are supposed to bring food to you, supply you with, let's say, 100 bags of rice, they leave it in Tamale. Now, between Tamale and Savilugu, for instance, the cost of transportation has to be borne by the school. And so it ends up adding up to the cost of the food that you are going to buy. You don't have money in these schools, and they are struggling to do all this. But that's not even where I want to talk, 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 talk about. Then I realized something. Sitting in the Public Accounts Committee, I realized that soul sourcing has become the order of the day. The same soul sourcing this The same soul sourcing this administration vehemently, vehemently opposed about. and lampooned us and blasted everybody under the Mama administration. And I just give you this time. But, but wait, just, just a quick one before you go there. Soul sourcing is not in itself a bad thing. I you agree. I agree. It's only in a certain context. I agree. Comes I agree. I agree. And so when the NDC was doing it, it should have been put in the right context. But we were told that soul sourcing is a conduit for corruption. And in 2018, Dr. Baumia said that we promised that we were going to move away from soul sourcing and we have delivered. That was what he said. If you can Google City uh, TV, you see it there. Today, let me give you this title. I decided to go onto the uh, PPA uh, website mm. with my, my, my research assistants. And what we have seen is that in dollar terms, first of all, let me look at the total figure that I've arrived at. Between 2017 to 2020, uh, Three thousand two hundred and seventeen single source contracts were examined, and the total amount involved is nine trillion six hundred and twenty million five hundred and seventy four thousand four hundred and eighty seven point five. Something is wrong there because you started with trillion, and that's a huge figure. Do you mean billion? Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, so that's billion, right? Sorry, that's billion. So it's nine billion six hundred and twenty million uh, five hundred and seventy. No, it's trillion, rather. Get me right. It's nine trillion, okay? Six hundred and twenty million. No, then it, the next must be billion. Yes, yeah, sorry, million six hundred and twenty million five hundred and seventy uh, thousand four hundred and forty-seven Ghana City fifty-seven pesos. I see. This is the total figure that I came out with. I think it's not even written very well here. And this is in CD context, put all together. Mm. So single source contracts between 2017 to 2023 from PPA uh, website, 1,217 contracts. And I went further to look at where these were coming from. Mm. And so Ghana Cocoa Board awarded a total of 141 uh, single source contracts. And that alone will give you over 6 billion. Now, in terms of the dollar and then the euro and pound sterling and all of that, I have the analysis there. What are we talking about? Apart from these single source projects that have been used to siphon money in their own ways, because they are saying that once you resort to single source contracts, it's a conduit for you to steal money. If you want to use their own words, this is how far they have brought us. In their own words, they are saying that... 1,217. 1, 1, 1,217 single source contract within this uh, period. Under the NDC, it was less than 1,000. But the president was even in the uh, 
uh, in Parliament to talk about it and to say that they are coming to save us from this corruption. Because in his own way, he said that using single source leads to corruption. What's the period again? When to 2017 to 2023. Okay, all right. You just go onto the uh, PPA website, you see it. There's another trend, and I can mention two, three institutions. In 2022, Public Accounts Committee, the Public, Corporation, Public and Corporation Board Audit Report, you have an institution like the National, no, the U, National Youth Authority, who had awarded contracts to the tune of about 35 million plus Ghana City, Varying that contract within three, four months to 73 million without recourse to the PPA Act. Another bridge there, about 38 million Ghana City was added up. This is a bridge, and this is a serious matter. I mean, nobody can prove to me that there's no corruption in this matter because already you have breached the law. Now, you also go to um, national lotteries, they are going to do single source and saying that they wanted the items under a certificate of uh, emergency. And so these items, there were small, small machines that were, you see these machines that they use at their right. vendor uh, points. points. They gave it to them. They ordered this uh, equipment. As I speak to you, since 2022, they are some of them are self-stocked in their warehouse. So where is the emergency here? Clearly, there's something wrong there. And many, 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 many of these things are what is happening in this, in this, in this uh, administration. And so when it comes to corruption, I'm not surprised that the president is now running away from talking about corruption. The vice president is running away from corruption. Listen to them very well. For the past two, three years, they are low when it comes to the issues of corruption. But in 2016, that was their highest point. And we know that from the SONA, it's one of the things... Uh, the yes, so, so for instance, in the SONA, it was silent. Right. Why will you be silent on a very important matter? So just to wrap on corruption, because in the next five minutes, I want us to look at two other questions. Yes. Basically, you're saying that we've not made any inroads. We have Shraj, we have the OSP, we have all these other institutions. We've not made any progress in, in terms of the fight against... So Ben, in 2017, 2018, for instance, 2018, 2019, the president said that once the Special Prosecutor's Office was established, he was so certain that we're going to deal with corruption and deal with it very well. You have a, stage, a situation where when the Special Prosecution's Office starts to work, you have state institutions interfering. Take the case of Cecilia Dapa. Even before OS, OS could start, OSP could start its work, the president had declared her. Because if you say that I have so much trust in her and blah, 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 you are prejudicing the outcome of the investigation. So point made on that. Let's talk and, about... Let's quickly, for the sake of time, let's talk about taxation. Um, there's a lot of non-compliance, we know. In recent times, we heard the vice president talk about granting a clean slate to those who are not on board so that they can come on board. And some have wondered how that will be executed as well, especially considering that that could also send the wrong signals to, to those who are paying. Right. Um, and then you hear the vice president also say that the, v, the GRA is hounding or chasing people and making life unbearable for them, businesses. The tax situation, where did we go wrong and how do we remedy it? Yeah, Ben, before I talk about where we went wrong and the way forward, I was wondering who was speaking. I was wondering, listening to uh, my good brother, Dr. Bahumia, whether indeed uh, he was the one talking about taxes and talking about uh, talking the way he was talking. Now we all know that he got his job as a vice president because of his perceived expertise, okay, in the management of our economy. The president was so clear by saying that, look, I need somebody with economic background to partner me. And indeed, it was this reason that they used to convince many, many, many MPP uh, stalwarts to accept him because they saw him as somebody who was not even part of them. So these were the points that were used, that look, he's an expertise in the, uh, the management of our economy, he's all of that. And so they were able to push him to, even though he was not a party member. He came and he started his work very well. 
and he was the one heading, or he's still the one heading, the economic management team. The economic management team can look at both physical and monetary issues. They have the right to do that because they need to work in collaboration with both monetary and physical policy units. And he is the one sharing this uh, uh, team. So the question to ask is, did he have these ideas long before, or is none that he's thinking of these ideas? If indeed he had these ideas long before, did he suggest this to the president or not? But the president has told you, the vice president has said he's like a driver's mate. I'll come the to president that. president in the sonar. So, so, so the if you're a driver... The buck stopped with him. If you're a driver mate, you have a responsibility. Your work is cut out as to what to do and what not to do. And I'm saying that his work was cut out for him and that he was supposed to manage the economy. He was supposed to be the head of the economic management team. Is he saying that he has failed in doing that? If he has not failed, then it means that, one, he had these ideas, but decided not to tell the president so that he can keep them to himself. Today, he wants to run for presidency, and now he comes to use them. Or he suggested to the president, and the president refused. So what's the In way? both cases... H how do we get out of this? How do we... Yes, I'll come to that. We've always spoken about the fact that we've not stratified our tax regime properly. A few people are overburdened with taxes, and there's a chunk of people who are not paying taxes, though we all pay indirect taxes. When you purchase the credits and all that, you pay taxes. What's the way forward? Yes, but you are moving me away from looking at the person talking and whether or not what he's saying is... One more right. minute on that. Yes, so one, 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 one more minute on that. Look, in 2017, and you can still Google, even if you go to the trade, uh, uh, Ministry of Trade's website, they have 13 comprehensive points that they had listed be able to transform or industrialize this uh, country. And the number two was that they were going to reduce interest rate and also reduce the burden uh, of taxes on enterprises. That was the, the second uh, point that they raised. Fast forward, what has happened to that? And you're now coming to tell us that you have new ideas. Why didn't you suggest these ideas to your president? And if you have done that, one evidence that yes, I have done that, if not, I would describe my brother as a wicked person. Because if well, you are... That, yes. That, that, that is a strong... No, it's not. Are, hold on, hold on. You're describing the vice president as... Wicked. On condition that if indeed he had these all ideas that he could supply to his boss and he refused and was taking salary and sitting there, then he could be described as a wicked person. But if he did, uh, what is it called, suggested these things to the president, the president refused, that's a different matter. And we want evidence from him to show that, yes, I have advised him, he refused. Because he was employed as a vice president but to But he has already said that it's not anything that he comes up with that is accepted. He exactly. said that already. My point is that if you have said that and they refuse, let's know. Because again, we pay you. Ghanaians pay you. And they expect you to deliver. So why are you telling those that you have been able to achieve and not telling those that you have had difficulties in, uh, in pushing them Okay, through? so in, enough on the vice president. What's the way forward? How do we... So do? let me tell you. Another minute. This, 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 uh, give me some two, three minutes. This idea of uh, flat rates hasn't started today. But the way the, president, the vice president is proposing it is unsustainable. Now let me just ask a question. In the 2024 budget... Tax revenue is estimated to be 11 billion. Okay? And he was part of the drafting of this uh, budget. He didn't see anything wrong with that. Now you're saying that in 2025, when you come, you will ensure that there's no tax payment. Now it means that. I, I 11, don't think that's what he's. No, he said that it's going to be general amnesty. Yes, but an amnesty means we're wiping no, the slate clean, but you are going to start. No, he payments. said you're not going to pay at all for a certain period. He yes, said but he's saying that we are starting afresh. That's yes, what, so they are going to start. But he paying. said that he said that he's going to have a clean sheet, and he's going to ensure that there's tax amnesty. Tax amnesty means that you won't pay taxes. I get it, and but I'm I say that, moving forward after that, the same people are going to have to pay now. No, Don't but pay. what I, I come to that. But what I'm saying is that you see, you have to look at the statement he's made, whether it's sustainable or not, mm. whether that statement is honest or not, whether that statement he meant it or not. In other words, the because, 11 billion that has been projected, if those people don't pay, is that what you are suggesting? No. So what I'm saying is that if today you are saying that we need 11 billion, and that 11 billion will be used to solve some of our social problems, okay? 
And you are saying that when you become a president, God forbid, in 2025, you're going to give tax amnesty. People, amnesty, people will not pay taxes. Now, if people don't pay taxes, how are you going to mobilize revenue to be able to meet the basic things? We have educational issues, we have health issues, and all of that. Don't also forget that some of these taxes that we pay go into some statutory uh, funds. What happens to those funds? Get fund is there. National health insurance is there. What are you doing about them? That's the other uh, angle, angle you have to look at it. But you see, point, it is not about, it's not about flat rate, it's not about progressive tax regime or regressive tax uh, regime. The problem, if you ask me, is it all boils down to the issue of compliance. People, even the, the, the few that are paying are not paying. Yes, you can expand it. But if you don't address the issue of non-compliance, you still have problems. Why are we having problems with non-compliance? One is because of the perception of the unfairness of our tax system. Look, Adam Smith in his uh, book stated... You, you had to go to Adam Smith. Yeah, and stated came. four principles that we have to always look at. The principle of equity or equality, mm. the principle of convenience, the principle of e economy, and a again, you have to also look at the issue of whether or not they even have what it takes to be able to pay it. Now, so if you are able to look at all these things and relate them to whatever decision you take, you'll be able to get a behavior change that will result into... Uh, payments of the taxes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Unless you want to yes. land on that. Yeah, so, so what I'm saying is that, let me, mm. let me tell you what I think should be done. Right. So the issue of tax uh, perception right. will have to be addressed. Mm. Now, there's a relationship, and literature has established that. There's a relationship between tax perception and tax compliance behavior. There's a relationship. In between this relationship is the issue of, uh, if you like, tax legitimacy. Now, if there are problems with institutional trust, which we are facing today, the vice president mentioned the issue of the GRA going to sit at people's places and all of that. And so uh, this whole uh, issues of non-compliance boils down to uh, the fact that we will not be able to address this issue. Ben, I thought that I would have had enough time to look at this, but uh, we can make this another time. But I think already we've, we've looked at major angles in respect of this. And at least that point you make about the, the, the projection of 11 billion versus how the vice president is going to be able to rake in the required revenue to power the economy yeah. in respect of what he's saying uh, leaves a lot or gives us a lot of fodder for our minds. But, Yusuf, thank you for joining us oh, we are done? Uh, this morning. <laughs> ben, I think that you should have, you should have time today, for me to look today at Today has a, a packed show. And, for me to look, um, at, look at this issue of uh, taxation and, and what the... Pre, uh, 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 let's let's, let's see what issues percolate on the back of this and let's have further conversations, maybe together with other tax-oriented people. Yes, I would love on that. These. I'll, I'll love that. But that's another opportunity we'll see. But let me thank my, my, my brother and uh, the family, the former president and uh, the wife, they are Christians, and I know today is Good uh, Friday. Friday, even though they are not Catholics, I don't expect them to dress like the way you are dressed. <laughs> it's a period that today is a very special day. Muslims are fasting. Today is a Friday, okay, and today is also a Good Friday for Christians. I ask that we are able to work together as a people. There should be peace in this country, and on that note, I want to also uh, thank the people of Bole Bamboy. For this honor, I mean, I've always said that, Ben, I'm from a poor home, but they have honored me by making me a member of parliament, representing them. And so I've always said to myself that uh, I owe them and I want to see peace in that area. And I tell you, 2025 is their year. 2025, when Mama becomes the president, inshallah, Bole, and for that matter, Savannah region, and by extension, the North will take its right position so that we are okay. able to close the gap, okay? While he's developing the southern sector, he also look at how to bring the northern sector on board so that we have a country where you have our young children refusing education and running to Accra, and, and, and people will end up building hostels for them, like my brother, Dr. Bohemia, uh, is doing. Your brothers and your sisters are running here in, in search of a greener pasture, and all you do is to accommodate them by building hostels for them. 
I see Where every, are we going every, going? every opportunity you get, you Thank will you. want to take on uh, the vice president. Of no, course, the former president I'm himself, a member of parliament for that area, uh, Bole Bamboy. Thank you, Yusuf, for joining us for well, breakfast I'm grateful. Uh, this morning. No. Yusuf Suleimana is a member of parliament for Bole Bamboy. He joined the conversation here. But do stick and stay. We have a lot more coming your way as we host the 2022 National Best Teacher um, who is on a mission to award outstanding teachers, especially in rural communities. We'll be right back. as well as the lynch in Ghana. Thank you so much for this. I'm humbled. Thank you. Some of you have thought for over uh, two decades, but you've not received any appreciation. This award is a surprise to me, and it's going to encourage and motivate me to work more to glorify God at Danwell and my school at home. Thank you. Nobody lights a candle and puts it under a table. Nobody will see the light. Exactly. First of all, I'm very grateful to God to this award. I wasn't expecting it, but what God has done for me is that this award is going to prepare me to do more for the kids and even beyond the classroom. Because, as the Bible says, hard work is. So, my work has been recognized and this helped me. To do more and more in the teaching profession. And so, it's that you put yourself out there. Nobody knows what you're doing in singing. This feels so good. It feels so great. Um, I'm grateful to Teacher Applaud Initiative for this honor than me. Um, what he's expected, the feeling is awesome. I'm so grateful. It's, it's going to help me do more because it shows that I'm being recognized. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, Chimala. God bless you. I'm grateful. Through her initiative, she's done a lot of things that I see from afar. Through her Thank you. 